Hello and um, welcome to the lecture on stream restoration. Today we're going to understand the design and restoration techniques that are used and the importance of hydrology and the stream bed characterization in this process. So when we talk about stream restoration, we're basically talking first about the hydraulic cycle. So basically runoff occurs when um, rainfall exceeds infiltration and um, this runoff drives the rise and fall of stream levels during and after rain events. Um, but also the rainfall that does infiltrate um, actually does reach the stream um, through the percolation and, and groundwater recharge. And this is actually the main source of base flow in stream channels. So when we look at streams, there's different, you talk about stream orders. So there's first, second, third, fourth order streams. So what that means is when a um, two first order streams come together. So if we have um, two first order streams coming together here, when they come together, they create a second order stream. Now when two second order streams come together, they then create a third order stream. And when these two third order streams come together, they then create a fourth order stream. So you can also have streams where you have, you know, first coming into second and the second going directly into a fourth, or you can even have just a first order stream coming into a fourth. Um, but basically the, um, the orders are basically what the, it's through the whole, and all of this is part of the same watershed and it basically flows down into um, fourth order, fifth order and two water bodies. So when we look at um, what, ecos what streams, ecosystem services that streams provide, um, you can think of it as provisioning. So that's our water quality, our water source for agricultural, domestic, industrial uses, power generation, hydropower, um, transport, boats, supply of aquatic organisms for food, um, for medicines, fish, oysters, um, algae. Um, regulatory, we, we maintain um, water quality, the regulatory, um, for water quality maintenance, um, for flood for flood control, um, for cultural, it might be for recreation, tourism, spiritual values, and also they provide certain supporting services for nutrient cycling, sediment transfer, primary production, predator prey, and ecosystem resilience. Um, stream restoration is is not only not always consistently defined, but usually there's several elements that are involved in stream restoration. One is a desire for kind of a more natural looking channel. So getting rid of some of the hard surfaces, the concrete surfaces, and putting in more of a natural stream. Um, integrating ecology with geomorphology and, and engineering and working with natural processes. So working with the natural flow of the stream um, to create a self-sustaining design. Self so when we look at stream ecology, um, some important considerations, we're going to think about the life cycle of these organisms, the spawning patterns and cycles of fish, um, the suitable depth for different target species, um, the barrier to organism passage, again, going upstream and downstream, food cycles within the river systems, as well as a desirable temperature range. And again, we're going to be thinking about the entire food, food web, the food chain here, and not just fish, but also those um, organisms that are needed to support the higher level organisms. So some examples of stream restoration. Um, you might be doing bank stabilization. Um, here you can see an, an inside stream. So we might be actually just, you know, reformatting this, this stream and revegetating it. Or we might have a complete different design where we take a stream and design a completely new channel pattern that's more sustainable and then bring the, the river um, through this new channel or realignment. Um, often when we have um, stresses on our streams, it's often due to urbanization. If you look at kind of a, um, a peak flow here, so we have a rain event that comes and the discharge, the quantity, our Q, um, again, gets, gets here high, is under a natural conditions, and then it starts to go and we reduce, re, um, reduce down to base flow conditions. But when we have a very urbanized stream with a lot of impervious surfaces, then you don't get a lot of the um, percolation and all the water goes very quickly into the stream. And so you get, although it's the same, you know, it's a similar quantity, you get it very quickly and very, um, you know, very um, um, 
rush of water coming through, which can actually damage the um, the stream itself. And so again, they put um, stress on the banks and they decrease the sediment discharge because you have all the sediment coming with it. It's a very powerful stream. And so this can be based on urbanization, development on a floodplain, channelization, mining, logging, farming, other things that can put stresses on streams. So if we look at stream restoration in the US, again, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, and if you look at kind of the number of, of, um, of, of projects, again, most of them being with um, going from here from top to bottom with the most here from water quality to riparian management, um, in-stream habitat improvement, fist passage, bank stabilization, um, flow modifications, aesthetics, um, dam removal, stormwater management. Again, um, there's a lot of reasons why we do these stream restoration efforts. Um, so if we look at a stream, so we need to kind of understand a stream in order to restore it. And so streams have basically banks and beds and um, the beds are gonna be some sort of substrate that's usually different than floodplain soil. And they're gonna contain pools, ripples, steps. Um, here's a riffle and a pool here point bars, meanders, floodplains, and they might contain and a terrace. Um, and again, all of this is driven by the interactions between climate, geology, topography, vegetation, and land use changes in the watershed. And so if we look at kind of the, the current as it goes through the stream, again, you have this meander coming through. Oops. Um, you have this meander coming through, and then you have your thaw wag. So again, this is your um, point of maximum um, flow. This is actually the deepest part of the channel and it kind of defines where that flow of the river goes. And so you can see here the thawway is going to move as it goes through the meanders. Um, so if we look at some of the characteristics, again, looking at channel pattern, channel pattern um, is going to be, refers to the aerial view of the channel. So it's looking at um, the streams in a steep, narrow valley, for example, are gonna be very straight um, versus streams in a, block, in a broad, flat area are gonna be more sinuous, okay? They're gonna have a higher sinuosity. And so stream pattern can be, defined by measuring the sinuosity, the meander wavelength. So again, the wavelength here from that each meander that goes through, the radius of the curvature. So again, this radius of curvature that we have here, as well as the belt width. So again, how far up and down it goes in those curves and the meander length. Um, again, so that stream sinuosity is the channel length measured along the direction of the fall of the valley and a meandering stream increases resistance and so it reduces the channel gradient um, relative to a straight reach so again it reduces the power of that stream during that meander process and so the meander geometry the spacings of pools and riffles adjust so that the stream can per, um, basically performs minimal work and balances its energy within this um, channel pattern and then you have the channel profile itself. And this is gonna be the longitudinal slope. And so it's gonna look at the size of the bedding material. Generally that size, as you get higher in the stream, the upper waters of the watershed, it's gonna be um, um, larger bed material generally, and it goes to smaller silt material as you move down the watershed. And again, the slope is gonna be inversely related to the sinuosity. So something that has a very high sinuosity, its slope is gonna be much less than something that has a very straight is often gonna have a, a steeper slope. And so if we look at this as kind of your basic lands diagram that um, basically shows when channel is gonna degrade versus aggregate versus build up, okay? So basically the sediment size and the load, the amount of sediment and the size of the sediment is proportional to the channel slope and the discharge coming through. So you can think about the water and um, the sediments, they need to be in balance, okay? And so when you have a change in one of these variables, then it can cause a change in the stream flow. So if you have um, higher discharge coming up, that's pushing that down, then you're going to have more sediment load. So the product of that sediment load and size is proportional to the product of the stream slope and the discharge or the stream power. So as the power goes up, then you're gonna have more sediment that's carried within that stream to try to balance that out. 
Um, so when we look at doing stream restoration um, or just, just understanding a stream, the first thing we want to understand is that bank full discharge. So the bank full discharge is basically our bank full width is the basically at the point at which we have flooding. So here you can see our bank full elevation here. So here's where it's usually flowing. So this is, this is where the, the baseline flow here. And then here is going to be our bank full width. So it's the flow rate that discharge is going to be the flow rate times the air of that surface water. So blank full of discharge is basically what forms the channel. It's going to transport. So again, these, these sediment transport events are only going to happen every other year, maybe a couple times a year, depending on the year, maybe not, and not at all one year. Um, but it's going to form and maintain the channel when it's at that, that bank full discharge. It's basically the point before it moves on to the floodplain. Um, so in an incised stream, though, the bankful stage may be like at a bench or a scour line if it can't get all the way up to the floodplain if it's in size so much over time. Um, so you can estimate this bankful discharge by direct measurement. You can go out and measure it. Um, you can, during a flooding event, <laughs> um, you can do a stage discharge curve if you have a gauge site available, or you can estimate it um, with the, basically the flood occurrence of about two years. So the idea that this bankful discharge flow has a basically a 50% probability of occurring in a given year. And so again, here we are kind of measuring um, with a survey now, um, with the surveyor's tape is how we used to do it. Now it's often with, um, with um, GPS systems. But again, you're here and what we're looking at is you're measuring the depth so that you can get the area of this bankful discharge area. Um, and then you're gonna get it basically until you get to the point of where the water would then go onto the floodplain. Um, so here again, you have your channel. And so here, right now, we're at Bankful. It's on the verge of going out into the channel, into the floodplain. Um, and so the Bankful flow is when it's almost gonna spill out. But sometimes it's not that easy to define that bank flow. So for example, if it has bedrock, as it does here in this Wilson's Creek, um, it's much harder because that sediment can't be transported on a bedrock stream or if it's a highly disturbed river that's down cut it a lot, so it's incised a lot. So you can see the floodplain is way up here um, on, on this and in, in this. So here's where the water is. It's not gonna get up there. So it's gonna create another bankful discharge point and lower, and it's not gonna get up to where you would consider the floodplain. Um, so here, for example, is this idea where they have these secondary terraces. So you can see here, it's not gonna get all the way up to this side where it's gonna flow is right here, and that's gonna be the bank full discharge because it's incised. Um, so in order to kind of help with um, understanding um, stream restoration, um, there was a classification system um, created by a guy named Rosgen. Um, he's actually in Colorado, and you can go and take his seminar courses, um, a couple week course where you really understand stream restoration. And basically what he did was he tried to predict a river's behavior based on its appearance. And so it's developing specific hydraulic and sediment relations for a given stream type. And that would basically provide the mechanisms to have a site-specific data and to find a stream with a similar site-specific data of, of where your stream is. And so that you can figure out what is the best restoration. So instead of just taking a stream here in PG County and just looking at the nearest stream, be like, all right, let's do it to here. Well, that stream may not be the same type of stream. So the idea is that you need to find a stream that is this has the same characteristics as a healthy stream and try to restore to that level. And so the idea is that it provides a consistent frame for referencing and communicating about stream morphology and conditions um, across a variety of people. So the idea is that you look into the watershed, you look into the drainage network, and then you look at the state of this entire um, system to try to classify. These are for classifications of streams. So this is what the Rosin classification looks like. <laughs> so basically you would have a stream where you're looking at the entrenchment ratio, the width to depth ratio, the sinuosity, and then you get a stream type. It's an A, G, F, B based on if it's very sinuous, if it has multiple channels, one channel. Then you look at the slope within there and then you look at the bedding material. And so then you'll come down, okay, this is a B4 stream um, based on these classifications. And so we'll go through how that works. Um, so basically 
it's based on eight variables for the string um, for the Rosman um, classification system. So he looks at um, channel width, channel depth, the velocity, the flow, um, which is again your Q, the channel bed slope. So again, how much it sloped meters per kilometer or percent slope, um, the roughness factor, the Manning's in, and we'll talk about that. Um, the sediment size, so um, the size of the sediment that you have, how big is the sediment in there, and then the sediment load. And so we'll go through this. So if we look at bedding material, so we have bed rocks and boulders. So these are going to be hard to move. They're going to be greater than 100 millimeters, for example, um, versus your silt and clay less than 0.1 millimeter is going to be very easy to move. Um, and so basically when we look at a D50 or a D85, D50 would mean that 50% of the material is in that class and D85 is 85% of the material in that class. And then your shear stress, which we're going to review, is the force that moves this bedding material related to the velocity that comes through. So again, as your velocity gets higher, your shear stress is going to get higher and it's going to force more of the bedding material to be moved and bedding material to it at like a higher, um, higher size if the power gets high. So what we do for the first for the bedding material is first we need to count the the sediment of the, the bed of the stream. And so you do a gravel bed um, surface doing a Woolman count from the 1950s. We still use it. So basically you take the surface, you pace through and at intervals, a particle next to the your toe is basically sampled at every interval as you walk. Then you're going to sample, do a pebble count, and then you're going to move and do another pebble count. And so you basically choose the, your pattern of how many pebble counts you do across the stream um, to kind of capture the spatial variability in the texture. And what you do is you measure the gain, the grain size with the caliper. So you basically, if you have a, um, a rock here, so if I have a rock here, I have a caliper where I'm going to put it down and then it'll tell me here looking at this caliper, um, what is that millimeter size and then I'm going to write this down. And basically I'm going to determine all of the sediment right there in that, that sample where my toe is. I'm going to determine in that area what is the distribution of all of the rocks there um in that area so you mainly do it um, for larger materials if it's very small silty containers if it's less than four millimeters then we're not going to use that we're just going to call it you know sand or silt and so then basically you would put on here so here's your particle count um so here's kind of the inches that you have and or millimeters too and then you say you just check 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 this is how many i've had for each one of each pebble count is going to be for each um for each step as you take it through and then you're going to add them together to find out what your d50 and your d85 is um, so here's an example of what that looks like so if we look at the higher range and lower range material this is the number of grains that we counted this is the percent that we got and so then you can kind of do this figure out the percent of grain size um, the other thing that we're looking at again is that shear stress and so when we look at the shear stress equation, we're looking at the fluid density and the acceleration rate um, with this drag coefficient. And this drag coefficient is kind of the force that's going against it. And that is, again, based on this roughness factor, this D, you know, 65 to 85. What is the roughness of the surface? And this relates to our Manning's equation of flow. So when we look at our Manning's equation, our flow rate, um, we see that our flow rate is proportional to the cross-sectional area, the radius that we have here of our stream surface. And then again, it looks at the slope, obviously how you know it's gonna flow faster with a faster slope. And then it looks at this Manning's roughness factor. So what is the bedding material? Because that bedding material is going to, with boulders, it's gonna just dis, um, disrupt the flow as it's going through versus you're gonna go faster flow with, without that disruption. So here would be a, um, a Manning's, a low Manning's number, so not as much disruption. So here we have, you know, kind of more silty clay, so this is 0.03, um, again, sandy clay soils, versus this is as 0.07, excuse me. So this has bedrocks, and so again, you have disruption in that flow um, because your, your roughness factor is greater. Again, moving on in the, in the Rosin classification system, the other thing we're looking at is the slope. So again, this is just the bed elevation over the distance that you go down um, the, the stream. 
And so what you would do is you would do a survey um, from the profile and then the reach would be determined to determine that slope and it needs to be long enough so that we go through any bends or, you know, um, bends in the channel because we're looking at the longitudinal um, down slope versus the elevation. Um, we're also going to look at the pools and riffles. And so we're going to look at here's kind of our profile of our riffles and then our pools and understanding where our bank full measurements are here within these pools and riffles. Um, we're going to look, we already talked about the meander length and the meander width. Um, and then we're going to look at that um, meander width ratio. And again, those radius of curvature that we talked about earlier. And so this is again, making those measurements um, to, do, to classify your stream. And then we're also going to look at what type of channel is it? Is it, is it really sinuous? So a meandering channel with greater than 1.5 sinuosity, is it less sinuous? Does it have a braided channel where you have actually sediment bars in the end and it kind of goes around that? Um, and so again, to calculate the sinuosity, we're going to look at the, at the valley length um, over the stream length. So how much stream do we have if we just go straight? How sinuous is it? Um, and so here's again our major types of streams. So this is we have our, you know, our A stream, B stream, C, D, these braided channels, and these are the different slopes that you have. So again, your A stream is going to be highly sloped um, versus your E, e F, G are going to be um, much less slope and much more sinu and sinuous. And so here we are back to where we are in terms of taking in all of those things into consideration, your, your entrenchment ratio, how deep, how deep entrenched they are, but single threads or multiple threads, very sinuous, not very sinuous, and then the slope, and then finally the bedding material here. So here's an example of a C4 stream. So we go back here, so this is C4. So it's a slightly entrenched, moderate width, moderate sinuosity, and then C4 means it's, it's dominated by gravel. And so here's our C4 stream, and you can see that it's entrenched here, and so it's, it's cutting away that surface as it goes across um, during bankful discharge, during flooding events, it's cutting away at that surface. Again, during normal flow, it's not. It's that bankful discharge, that the flooding events that's causing this erosion. And so here would be a reference C4. So then we can see, okay, these are both C4s, they have similar, um, characteristics so that we can look to this C4 as we try to restore our unstable C4. Um, so our basic steps to restoring this is going to be, you know, what's wrong with this? <laughs> what's wrong with the stream? Is there an actual problem? Who are the stakeholders, the funding sources, the cultural issues? Again, we've gone through this talking about ecological engineering um, goals and bringing in your stakeholders. You're gonna assess at the watershed level if possible, because again, what are the upstream, downstream, what are the influences that are gonna come into this watershed? And looking at the connectivity, um, identify alternatives, evaluate, choose your design, implement it, and then monitoring and assesses an assessment, assessment with adaptive management. Um, so when we look at kind of these themes of restoration, we're gonna be looking at, again, the pattern, the geometry, the grain size, the floodplain in the relation to the channel, the biota, the engineered structures, and then the history and the context of the stream. So here we have, again, some, um, oops, some incised channels. So here's, again, our bankful discharge. So here's our water table. Here's our baseline flow. And here's our bankful discharge. So first one, we have an incised channel. So this is where it's, it's not where the floodplain is. The bankful discharge is not in the flood, so it doesn't have a place to discharge that energy so it's just picking up the bed material and taking it with it um, during flooding events and so here's another here's another where we have the um what we can do for this one is basically we can fill in the old channel and create a new channel that's at the bankful discharge um, here's another one where we have again here's our bankful um, discharge and so what we can do to redefine the floodplain here is again, if it's down here, we can fill this in so that we can create a new floodplain here at Bankful Discharge. So lower the floodplain so that it's a new level since we can't get to that old floodplain out there. And then finally here we have, we can create a new, we can narrow the floodplain. Um, so again, here's our um, Bankful Discharge. 
and instead of it instead of it going here we have a narrower floodplain where we actually create a new floodplain here um, to again absorb the flow events so here's some examples of this so what we would do is we would go through our stream restoration to or sorry through our stream measurements um, through our surveying to kind of create these um, charts so here's our bank full here and um, you can see that it's way down here and our um, floodplain is up there so then what we would do is just create a whole new stream right here and this is our new stream that's actually at bankful or near bankful and so that we can actually re um re um put the floodplain and the channel back into um joining um so again here is a um a stream that's that's highly eroded here and so again what they've done here is they've created a new floodplain um, within so the floodplains up here and so it's eroded down into its incised and so now they have a new floodplain that's been created and they've kind of widened it out and created a floodplain since it can't reach the floodplain that's way up high so again here's our existing and then we just created a new floodplain here um, since we can't get back to that floodplain up there because it's so incised um, Here's another one where we're looking at, um, this is kind of before the restoration where you can see again that um, in, in deep incisement where we're getting erosion here. And so again, what they've done is they've basically, um, the design is create this floodplain here where there wasn't one before. So now if you can see here, the river can come right out here because it wasn't, it was incised over here. So we create a new floodplain um, down near the channel. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, so we might, you know, change the, the flow of the river. We might actually, instead of doing, changing the bank pool, we might just do some stream stabilization where we armor it. Here's a Gabion wall. Here's um, armoring using um, trees, logs. Um, we might use boulders to kind of stabilize um, the stream surface. We might use root wads. The idea with the root wad is not only to stabilize, but it also can provide habitat um, from a bend that's coming through and protect the soil. Um, so we might even put in these um, things called J-hook structures. So here's, we have this a lot if you go over to Looney's um, in College Park, you'll see these J-hook structures. So again, this is going to protect this erosion that we have here and keep the stream um, the thawway, the, the main part of the of the stream flow, we're going to basically j, j hook it. So we're going to stabilize it. We're going to cave it into the bank and then j into the water, so that again the stream's going to flow this way and protect this area of um, of erosion that we had. Um, you can also create um, weirs and cross veins. So again, here's our, our flow here. So we want to actually control the scour point. So instead of scouring on the side, we kind of bring it into the middle and then create the flow um, here to protect erosions on, on the side. Um, so I'm just going to go through some here before we finish is some um, pictures of basically this is during the stream restoration. So creating these riffles here. So this is after. Again, there's a lot of different stream restorations handbooks. There's a lot of different um, services. A lot of businesses do this. This is something that we do a lot. Um, here are just some photos from, this is from North Carolina, some stream restorations. So this is actually during restoration where again, they're, um, they're stabilizing the bank and creating a new floodplain. The floodplain was way up here. They're creating a new floodplain here. It's after restoration. Again, after restoration, where you can see those J hooks in, so they can start here and then go here, and that's going to protect um, the erosion that was happening here. Um, here is again, you can see during restoration, they've created these um, this weir here, and they've created these um, um, weir, so it's coming through here, and then they're replanting the side of the new floodplain. Um, again, here's again during restoration. Here, what they're doing is they're actually um, diverted the stream elsewhere so they can create everything that they need here and then they'll bring the stream back. Again, during restoration as it's the stream's coming back on. Um, here again, you can see they have the, the um, root wad here and they have the log coming here to again protect the erosion that was happening here and building a new floodplain here. Um, this is flooding after restoration, so you still get flooding. And so, but then again, the idea is that the 
we're bringing it through instead of it going out to the side and pushing in all of the, we're protecting the bank here um, from bringing all of the sediments from the bank into the river. And so again, here you can see during flooding. So this area is being protected here. And this is again, a, a, a log here. So this area is being protected during this large flooding event. And that's the stream restoration lecture. So thank you very much. And um, we'll um, talk about it more in class on Tuesday.